God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. I need help. 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 So do they. So do they. So do they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to your best 10 minutes, a series on prayer for people who struggle to pray. If you've got prayer figured out, you might want to doze off. The rest of us are going to tune in and allow God to talk to us about how we can empower every day with prayer. It's good to be back. I was out last week. Some of you remember my message originated in England. That seemed to go over well, and so I'm working on a deal where next week the message can originate in the Vatican. <clears throat> well, they're in, they're in between preachers right now. <laughs> so I'm thinking if somebody can pull some strings, that'd be a cool thing. <laughs> it seems to me that we can reduce prayer down to a single sentence. And as we unpack this sentence every day in our lives, allow this prayer to serve as a guide for our prayer lives, we tap into a hidden source of power that many people overlook. The prayer in its entirety goes like this. The words are going to appear on the screen, and, and you can say them aloud with me if you'd like. God, you are good. You're my daddy. You're in charge. Your kingdom come. I need help. Heal me. Encourage me. Lead me and pardon me. So do they. Those I love, those I don't, this hurting world, thank you. Amen. Amen. So we start off with a declaration. God, you are good. What do we mean when we say, God, you are good? Well, he has taught us that his goodness comes in the form of his paternal affection. When you pray, Jesus said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. We, we are invited to call God our daddy, our father. But then we are quickly reminded that, that though he is our father, he's also our king. And so we proclaim, you're in charge. You're the one running the world. I'm not. You are. And let your kingdom come. This is the goodness of God. And that is that a kingdom is coming. And so as we pray, we proclaim that truth and allow that truth to lift our eyes up off of this life into the next. When I was six years old and my brother was nine years old, my dad decided that it was time for the Locato family to have a new house. That's not uncommon, except for my dad was the ultimate do-it-yourselfer. He had already built the first two homes in which we lived, and now he was ready for us to move into the dream house, he called it. Three bedrooms instead of two. Room to park two cars instead of one. Brick, not wood. A workshop out in the back, and much to my mom's joy, a fireplace, a brick fireplace. Well, like I say, I was six, and my brother was eight, and my dad was, well, he was old enough to know that if you, if you build a house, you got to design it first. And so every evening, he sat there at the kitchen table designing the house. This was an era in which my mom was working the evening shift at the hospital. So it fell to my dad to make sure that my brother and I had dinner and baths, and got our homework done, and our teeth brushed. And that was also the time in which we got to watch him design a house. You talk about a contagious joy. He would let us sit at the table, and he'd say, what do you think we ought to put here, boys? Oh, Dad, put a swing set in the kitchen. Oh, Dad, put a, <laughs> put a bigger, bigger window over there in my room. I mean, we just had all these great ideas, and he was just great. And we incorporated all, he threw out the ideas that didn't work, but we put all the ideas together that did. And he gave my brother, and he gave me this invitation. Would you boys like to be a part of the construction crew? 
would you like to help me build it? Oh, man. Does a one-legged duck swim in circles? <laughs> Is the Pope Catholic? Yes, 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 of course we would. And so it came to be that for nearly uh, the entirety of, of a school year, my brother and I would jump on our bikes after school was over and pedal from Pease Elementary to Alamosa Street where my dad was already there with his best friend, Bill Richardson, and they were involved in the framing and the plumbing and the wiring and the building of this house. He was a builder at heart. You need to know that your heavenly Father is a builder at heart. The Bible says of his government, there will be no end. It is always increasing. He is always building. And he is dreaming not of a house on Alamosa Street, but he is dreaming of a new kingdom, a new kingdom, unlike anything you or I have ever seen, really even imagined. A kingdom in which there is life without cemeteries. A kingdom in which there are relationships without tears. A kingdom in which we walk with God with no guilt. A kingdom in which the lion will lie down with the lamb. All of nature will be in harmony. A kingdom in which the angels will walk with the saints. And most of all, a kingdom in which God will walk freely among his people. Your God is a builder. And your God, your heavenly Father, has issued to you the same invitation that my Father issued to my brother and to me. You want to be a part of it? You want to help me build it? You want to be on the construction crew? And our response is, you better believe it. You see, salvation at its simplest de definition is a yes to God's invitation to be a part of his new kingdom. That's all it is. When you say yes to Jesus, you're not joining a political party. You're not joining a moral crusade. You're just saying, I want to be a part of this kingdom you're building. I've looked around at this house in which we live, and, you know, it's got its weak points. It's got its, but I know I was made for more. And I want to be a part of this kingdom. Yes, yes. Yes, or you might respond the way Jesus taught us to respond and say, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. To understand God, we need to understand that he has a kingdom passion. God has a kingdom passion. In fact, you cannot read the story of Jesus without coming into contact with this passion that he has for a new kingdom. The very first time any reference was made to Jesus, Gabriel told Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his, what? Kingdom. This is the first reference made to Jesus. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then, in the very first words Jesus himself spoke, he said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe the gospel. At his last supper, Jesus promised a glass of wine in the future empire. He said, I will drink it new with you where? in my Father's kingdom. After his resurrection, Jesus dedicated six weeks to the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus is all about this kingdom. He's not shy about this kingdom. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. I doubt if there's a calendar in heaven, but if there is one hanging in the throne room, God has already circled the date on which the kingdom will be inaugurated or manifested on this planet. He has a kingdom passion, and it's no wonder. 
When you study the blueprints of the new kingdom, it's enough to get you excited. See, God not only has a kingdom passion, but he has a kingdom plan. And this plan is summarized in the verse that comes right out of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. In a sense, the kingdom is happening. In the sense, the kingdom hasn't happened. We're a part of a kingdom that is coming, and we're looking to a day, an inauguration day, in which the kingdom will be fully manifest on this earth. And this kingdom has some very distinct characteristics. For one, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. You see, heaven is heaven because it is a one king kingdom. It is a place where God's will will be done. In heaven, God's will will be done. Why? Because there's only one king in heaven. In this version of life, we all want to be king. Right? You want to run your life? I want to run my life. And some days I want to run your life. Now, what happens when everybody on the planet is trying to run the world? Chaos, disasters, wars, competition, allegation, adultery, murder. When every person in the world is waking up with this thought, my kingdom come, my kingdom come, my kingdom come. No wonder there's such chaos. Heaven will be heavenly because every person there will finally agree, thy kingdom come. You be king, Jesus. You be king. You run the show. You're in charge. You know everything. We gladly submit ourselves to you. Thy kingdom come. Can you imagine your life? Can you imagine your life? Had you every minute of your life done exactly what God said? How different would your life be right now if every day you had done perfectly the will of God? What arguments would you have avoided? What conflicts? from which would you have been spared? How many bitter days or depression or sleepless nights would you have avoided? Now you take that answer and you multiply it by several billion. Can you imagine our planet in which everybody woke up every day and said, okay, God, what do you want to do today? What do you want to do? That will be heaven. Hell is hell because hell is a place where everybody tries to run their own world. Heaven will be heaven because heaven is a place where we let God run the world. It's pretty simple. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Do not think for a second that heaven is some ethereal fog bank, some cluster of clouds somewhere between Pluto and Venus. <laughs> heaven is heavenly because heaven will be God's will done on this earth in which our heavenly Father will reclaim this planet that is rightfully His, that was made by Him as a place in which He could create a kingdom of people with whom He would live in harmony forever. He has not abandoned that plan. This planet belongs to Him. It will be purged. It will be cleansed. It will be restored. Boy, it needs to be restored, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul, when he described this planet, he said all of creation is groaning, groaning as if in pregnancy, awaiting for the return of Christ. 
It's grown. He compared this planet to a, a lady who's third trimester heavy, just kind of groaning in pain, anticipating a deliverance that is yet to come. That deliverance is coming. And on that day, thy kingdom will come on this earth and God will lay claim to every square inch, every ounce of dust, every drop of water, every cloud, every planet, every meteor, and everything will finally come into harmony. Our God is a God of restoration, not destruction. He is a God of recreation, not devastation. He is a God who restores. Jesus said it this way. He said, in the recreation of the world. Isn't that a great thought? In the recreation of the world. When the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule. Friend, every page of the Bible, every promise of Scripture, invites us to lift up our eyes and look ahead into the coming kingdom. Your father is a builder at heart. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he told his followers, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I, I wouldn't have told you. In other words, I don't go around making this stuff up. If it were not so, I, I would not have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you, a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, you can bet I will come back and I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. You were made to live with this hope you were made to live with this hope and you extract this hope of heaven out of your daily thought process and you're setting yourself up for a lot of gloomy days. Thinking about my dad's invitation to my brother and me surfaced another memory from my childhood and that's the day that my brother came home with a trombone from the middle school band. He decided he wanted to be in the band. He showed up with this trombone. I tell you what, it sounded horrible. He walked around like he was in a marching band. He walked around our house just playing that trombone. And I told mom to tell him to shut up. And it sounded like a dying duck or something. Just was horrible. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't read. It just was, and, but she wasn't about to send him outside because we had to be nice to the neighbors. <laughs> So this would go on every day for 30 minutes while he practiced his trombone. It was painful. Well, imagine my chagrin when my parents told me one day when I came home from school, tonight we're going to the middle school band concert. Oh, man. My brother times 100. I had no enthusiasm about that at all. And when we arrived at the auditorium, my lack of enthusiasm was justified because it was what I came to know later, the warm-up time. Have you ever been to a concert and everybody's warming up, right? Honk, honk, honk. <laughs> Clarinet, trombone, tuba, drum. Everybody's just doing whatever they want. But then the band director walked on the stage and he stepped up on the platform and he took his baton and just like that, everybody put their instruments down and waited for his signal. And then the instruments came back up. And you know, it wasn't half bad. <laughs> you understand, right? That in the great scope of human history, this is the warm up. This is the warm up. And that's why it just sounds so wacko sometimes. And that's why there's so much disharmony and sadness. This is the warm up. But there is coming a day, and it may be sooner than we think, in which the maestro will step out. And at that moment, 
all those who have said yes to him will enter into a time of eternal harmony. And those who have rebelled against him will have their request honored and they will be dismissed forever. Thy kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth, just as it is right now in heaven. God has a kingdom passion and God has a kingdom plan. And he invites you and he invites me to offer a kingdom prayer. And I close with this encouragement. Here's how it works. It's Monday morning. The alarm clock goes off. It lives up to its name, alarm. <laughs> honk, honk, honk. This is terrible. What a terrible thing to wake up to. You don't want to get out of bed. It's Monday. Monday came so fast. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just full of demands full of clients, full of reports, full of deadlines, full of junk. Oh, you don't want to get out of bed. It's still dark. You're still sleepy. The kids are still in bed. Your spouse is still in bed. The last thing you want to do is get out of bed. But you don't have a choice, right? You don't have a choice. You gave up all those days of sleeping in when you gave up your braces. You can't do that anymore. So you've got to get out of bed. Now, the old you would have stumbled into the den, turned on the television, and just got another 10 or 15 minutes full of toxic news. Sequestration. <laughs> Ambassador Dennis Rodman in North Korea. <laughs> Economy's going down. Republicans can't get along with the Democrats. The Democrats can't. Oh, man, what a great way to start the day. But for years, that's all you've done. Or you've listened to the radio, you know, just kind of, oh, yeah, just, just get more toxic, more poison, more bad news. Or you go and you turn on your email, more bad news, more demands, more this, more that. But lately, you've been doing things a little bit differently. Your preacher came up with this idea. He said, just take 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. And before you walk out into the world, walk into the presence of God. And so you do. Now you don't look like much. None of us do when we wake up. I mean, yeah, that's all right though, because nobody's, it's just between, between you and God. And you stumble into a room where there's a chair and you pour yourself a cup of coffee just to get a little bit of caffeine into the system. <laughs> it's still dark outside. You're still half asleep. But you say, okay. God, you're good. You're good. And your first declaration of the day is the goodness of God. You begin the day with a declaration that the devil does not like to hear, that causes any evil presence to leave. You say, okay, God, you're good. You're good. Maybe, maybe the weather's bad. Maybe the kids are bad. Maybe, maybe the economy's bad. But here's something I believe. I believe, God, you're good. And you know, the minute you say that, something starts awakening within you. Your spirit starts to awaken to the presence of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And you're defying all those thousand and one voices that are coming in wanting to tear you apart and pull you down. You're just saying, okay, here I am, Lord. You're good. You're good. And you're my daddy. You're in charge. You're the one to whom I turn. And Lord, whew, let your kingdom come today. Let your kingdom come. And rather than let your early thoughts be lost in the problems of this life, you immediately are lifting your eyes up and you're looking into the promise of God, the eternal kingdom that he has promised. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I mean, you're barely out of bed and all of a sudden you begin to feel your heart race. 
That's a great thought to wake up to. Maybe this week is going to be tough, but this week is going to pass and I'm going to set my heart on the kingdom of God. Yes, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And that truth begins to soak your soul. Kind of like standing underneath a waterfall. And you lock yourself on truth instead of lies. On hope instead of despair. And don't you think that'd be a good way to... You like my robe, by the way? (laughs) Don't you think that'd be a great way to start the day? Don't you think that'd be a great use of, I don't know, 10 minutes of your coffee break? Don't you think that'd be a great way to spend some of your lunch? What about that 20 minutes that you need every day to drive to work? What if you used a few of those minutes just to say, okay, Lord, your kingdom come. What if you took a few minutes before you went to bed at night and you turned off the news or or the racy television show and you just said, okay, God, thy kingdom come. Let me tell you something, friend. Those few minutes will change your life. They will. You'll be a better person. You'll be easier to live with. And you're sure going to love life a lot more when you're in communion with the one who made it. Dad finished that house, and he made my brother and me think we did something important, which we probably didn't. But it was a big deal, and it was a big day for the Locato family when he moved us into that house on Alamosa Street. He was so proud of it. (laughs) Can you imagine how proud our heavenly father's going to be when he moves us into the new kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Here we are, pilgrims. We tend to forget about the kingdom, Lord. And we gladly confess that we need you to remind us on a regular basis where we're headed, that this is just a transition place. It's just an airport terminal. We're just moving from one place to the next. This is not our home yet. Lord, set our minds on the home that you have prepared for us. Thank you, Lord, for this hope. And we offer this prayer in the name of the one who gives it, Jesus Christ. Amen.